I'm Mike Salem. From all of us here at CWH, we are grateful for your continued support and prayers. Today's message from my dad, Pastor Salem, the Song of Simeon is the last song in the December series. We pray that the peace, love, and joy of Jesus Christ will fill your hearts and homes this Christmas. I'm Pastor Salem, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Worship Hour, and with the same breath, I want to say Merry Christmas. Can you believe it? It just seems like we had Christmas the other day, and here it is again. I'm going to tell you something. The older you get, the faster they come around. I'm 95 and pushing 96, and, and every year goes faster. And so here we are, this wonderful day, Christmas Day. I love Christmas. There's a special place in my heart for it. And we've been seeing, thinking about the songs of Christmas. And today we're going to think about and look at the song of Simeon. And you're going to be surprised all that Simeon said and prophesied. But before that, I want to read some of the letters. We get so many wonderful letters, and uh, I just want to share them with you. Uh, the first one comes from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Thank you for your program. I love every bit of it. Keep going. I'm 84 years, and I want to be an, I want to be an answer to my mother's prayers. Listen to that. I'm 84 years and want to be an answer to my mother's prayers. I was the worst kid. Also, my grandparents that took my sister and I in after our dad left, my mother's health broke when daddy left. Isn't that sad? I want them, here's what she says, I want them to know their work was not in vain. And I have seen it so many times. Mothers go into go on to the glory. They never see their prayers answered. But later on, years later, their prayers are answered and they come to Jesus just like this woman and today there may be some of you, your mother prayed for you, and you ought to come to Jesus. Wouldn't that be something? Here's North Highland, California. Just letting you know I got saved watching your program. I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and enter my heart during your program July 30th. I've joined a wonderful church full of beautiful people. And so that's exactly what we want you to do. Get saved, get saved, and then get to with other people and worship the Lord. And then one other one, oh, I just have to share this. Olivet, South Dakota. Just a short note to let you know how much we really appreciate your good old gospel preaching and the saving grace of Jesus. We pray for you and your staff and ministry every day. We thank you for your prayer for us. Someday we'll all meet in heaven and talk it all over the good times. Right? Take care. Your old cowboy friend. I have four different cowboys that write and one sheep herder. And I was a sheep herder. And uh, I wish I could get more sheep herders to write. But uh, because I have a special place. Did you know that sheep herders are, uh, you know, that they're, they're busier and they work harder than cowboys? I'll tell you why. Those cows, they get them in the evening and they lie down and they chew their cud. But those sheep, you don't know when they're going to take off for the wild blue yonder, and you got to chase them down. And if you don't watch, and if they stray off, they'll never stray back. They'll never find their way back. That's why God says in Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray, turned to our own way. See? And a, a, a horse comes home, a cow comes home, chickens come home, bees come home, cats come home, dogs come home, chickens come home to roost. Everybody comes home. You ever see a sheep come home? No. So I just hope we'll hear more sheep herders. And the beautiful thing is, you know, they used to fight the cowboys and the sheep herders. You know why they fought? Because of grazing. And those sheep, they go in and they eat it so close, a, star, a cow will starve. So the cowboys didn't like the sheep herders. But when you're in Jesus, we love each other. And I'm just telling this brother, I'm leaving the corral gate open for him because I'll beat him. I'm 95 going on 96. I'll just leave the corral gate open and he'll come in and won't we have a visit. Well, now you write to us. We love to hear your letters and I'll give you the address at the end of the service. So get your pencil and paper and, uh, don't, and don't lay it down. You won't find it if you're like I am. Keep hold it in your hand. Just a few minutes, we'll be there. And we'd love to hear from you. All right, we're going to talk about Simeon, the song of Simeon. We know nothing of Simeon's life before he comes on the scene, and we don't know anything more about his life after he leaves the, leaves the scene. 
Sometimes people claim that he was a priest, but there's absolutely no grounds for that. And a, a tradition says he's 113 years old, but that's only a guess. Most Bible scholars I read think that he was a man of advanced age, but he wasn't 113 so far as we know. And so the St. Luke is the only one of all the four gospel writers. Luke is the only one that talks about Simeon. And he gives us one verse. And here it is, verse 25 in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 25. He says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. That's it. Now he says he was righteous. That means describes his relationship with his fellow man. He was a good man. He was a kind man. You could deal with him. You could work with him. You get along. And undoubtedly, everybody loved him. Then he was devout. And that's his relationship with God. And he was a dedicated, committed man to God, true to God. And he was a man of great faith. And I'm going to tell you something right off the bat. When we are devout, when we're right with God, we'll get along with other people. You get along with your spouse better, with your children, with your parents, with your church, with society, everybody. And when you find some reason, some old guy, it doesn't have to be an old guy, but most of the time it's older people, and he's ornery, and he's cranky, and he's impossible, you can just know right away he does not, he's not right with God. That's why he's upset. He's not right with God. And Simeon was right with God. Get right with God. Now this man was a good man, and it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Well, all that means is he was waiting for the coming of Messiah, the Messiah. He was waiting for the coming of Jesus. That's what Israel looked for from day one, from the Garden of Eden. Eve, Eve thought that her firstborn son might be the Messiah. And so they looked for that all the time. And now he's waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting to see the Messiah. This great man, Simeon, had the spirit received to him that he would not taste death until he personally see, had seen the Messiah. That's what God promised him. Now, that was a great promise. And a, only a devout Jew like Simeon could believe that. He couldn't. Otherwise, you couldn't believe it. Here, supposing God would tell one of us, I'm going to let you live until Jesus Christ comes from heaven. Would you really believe that? Simeon did. He was a great man of God. So the stage is set. Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple for the second rite. They're going to offer a sacrifice and dedicate him to God. When Mary and Joseph arrive at the temple, the Spirit of God says, tells Simeon, get over to a certain place in the temple. Get there, Simeon. And so he comes, and when the couple bring in the infant, the Holy Spirit makes Simeon to know that the Messiah had arrived. And in verse 27 and 28, and he came, that is, uh, Simeon, and Simeon came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. So God says to Simeon, go to a certain place in the temple and you'll be there. And when he comes in there, you'll see the Messiah. And that's exactly what happened. And he took him in his arms and godly Simeon takes him and he and takes him in his arms and he thanks God and he begins to sing. And this is what he sings. He starts out with a baby in his arms and he said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You know what Simeon is saying? Simeon is saying, I'm not afraid to die because I've seen the Savior. I've found the Savior and I can die. And I'm going to tell you, my friend, I, you need to be like Simeon and know Jesus and trust Jesus and love Jesus. And if you do that, you won't be afraid to die. But if you don't trust him and don't receive him, you're going to have a terrible, terrible future. God have mercy on your soul. So Simeon had taken into his heart the Lord Jesus, the wonderful Savior. And by taking him into his heart, he had found salvation. And because he found salvation, he wasn't afraid of death. He, not, he says, I'm not afraid to depart. He wasn't afraid of eternity. And I'm going to tell you, until and unless you have Jesus Christ in your heart and life, until you've called upon him to take away your sins and, to, and forgive you for your sins, you're not ready to depart for eternity. Believe me, you're not ready to die 
because of the strong faith in God, his acceptance of his son, he's prepared to die. And that is what we have can do when we have Jesus. And I took Jesus when I was 10 years old and I look forward to dying and going to seeing Jesus and all of my loved ones. I just don't want to leave my friends here because I not got some of them going to feel bad. Some of them going to say good riddance, but there's going to be some going to cry a little bit, I know. I hate to see them, so I have sorrow, but I'm ready to go anytime he wants me to. And so it, here it is, and by faith and confidence, Simeon declares, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And then he goes on and he says, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Now look at that for a minute. Old Simeon is here and he holds the tiny baby. He's more than just a baby. He's the son of God. He's God. He's God Almighty in the flesh. You say, I don't understand that. Of course you don't, you dodo. You can't understand God. You can't comprehend God. And so he is there. It's God in human flesh. And the only one that was sinless and stayed sinless. And here it is. He says he takes the baby and he holds him in his arms. He holds a Savior. And he tells us salvation is a person. Salvation is a person. Simeon says he sees God's salvation. What does he see? He's looking at a person. He's looking at Jesus Christ. Jesus is so named because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is so named because he will be the salvation from sin. Salvation is a person. It is not a church. Simeon didn't look over to the temple and say, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Salvation is not baptism. Salvation, Simeon did not look yonder at the Jordan River where Jesus would be baptized and say, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He has not good works because God says our good works like filthy rags. He says, I have mine eyes have seen my salvation, not in my works, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Simon said it here. Jesus said the same thing in John 14, verse 6. I am the way, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me a person. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him personally? No, I don't say know about him. The devil knows about him. Do you know him personally? Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and take away your sin and promise to turn from your sin? Because Jesus taught repentance. You don't live like a dog and call on Jesus and live like a dog. You start to live for the Lord the best you can. You'll never be perfect. You're a work in progress, but you're in progress. And that goal is to be like Jesus. That's what we look for. Lord. Jesus is the only way salvation. And if you don't find Jesus, you'll never find God. I'm telling you. Then Simeon goes on. He says, mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of the earth. And listen to this. It'll shock you to a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He, now, this is under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is talking to Simeon, and he says, I'm going to the, he puts the Gentiles before the Jews. And I want to remind you, dear friends, the Gentiles were never placed before the Jews. The Jews are the chosen people of God, and they always come first, but not here. And Simeon knows the Old Testament scriptures and they teach the Messiah is going to go to the Jew first. And when he comes to the Jews, they're going to reject him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And because they rejected him, he went to the Gentiles and the Gentiles believed on him by the millions. Millions of Gentiles have come to Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. The days will come though when the Gentiles will have their time fulfilled and then Israel will turn to the Lord Jesus. And a part of some Jews already are accepting Jesus as their Savior. For instance, the Jews for Jesus, what a wonderful organization. You ought to pray for them. They have taken him as the Messiah, but they're in the minority. But in that final day, there's going to be a great turning of Israel to God 
and the will will be a glorious day for the whole world. But here's Simeon talking about that and he's telling all about it. And then Simeon turns to Mary and he gives another prophecy in his song. He says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. When, when, what Simeon means is the fall and rising of many in Israel. Do you remember the scripture that declares the Lord Jesus Christ? Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. Israel stumbled over the lowly Jesus Christ. They stumbled over him. They stumbled over him, both houses of Israel. And they fell over the Lord Jesus because they, he didn't to fulfill their plan. Today they call it their narrative. Because they thought when the Messiah came, he would crush the Romans. He would set up a kingdom immediately in Jerusalem. And it would rule the whole world. That what they didn't know that there's a time space. All that's going to happen. There's going to be a day when Jesus sits on the throne of of uh, David in Jerusalem and rules the whole wide world. New York, London, Singapore, whatever you want. He'll be the king. But that isn't yet. To, that's yet to come. And now we have this time. So you see, God is, uh, uh, and so he, sees, he tells us, many are going to come to Christ and some are going to rise and some are going to fall. I'm going to tell you something, friend. There is a way they're in a certain way that man judges himself. That judgment is, and that means his re judgment comes from his reaction to Jesus Christ. And when a person is confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ, with his loveliness, with his goodness, with his kindness, with his beauty, with his gentleness, with his mercy and his love. Well, now, when a friend is, a man is confronted with that wonderful, beautiful, lovely Jesus, and if he opens his heart to Jesus Christ, he's saved and he enters the kingdom of God and he rises, he rises. But if that same person is confronted by the wonderful, glorious Savior, and if that person then is cold, and he's hostile, and he's ignorant, and he's unrepentant, and he's unmoved, and he's even indifferent, then that person is condemned, and that person is eternally lost. That person is going to end up in hell. He falls. And here it is. There's no middle ground with Jesus Christ. There's no neutral ground. You are for him or you are against him. That's what he said. And so it is. It is not God condemning men or man, but it is man condemning himself. That man, that woman, that young person, that child can accept Jesus Christ or he can reject Jesus Christ. And the ball is in your court. And the soul, son of God is going to reveal what's in your heart. Nobody can look into your heart, but Jesus tears it wide open and you're for him or you're against him. Bang. And you're the one that decides, I want to rise. No, I don't need Jesus Christ. I'll take my chances. And they say, all my friends will be in hell too. Well, the rich man was in hell and he begged God to tell his brothers, don't send them here. Or you'll be solitary confinement in hell along with the torment. Many will rise. Many have risen because they put their faith in Jesus. Seneca said so long ago that a man, what a man needed from above was a hand let down to lift him up. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus, uh, Jesus put his hand down to lift us up. And so it is the blessed hand of Jesus that lifts us from the old life to the new life. It's the blessed hand of Jesus, lifts us from the miry clay, sets our feet on the solid rock. It's the blessed hand of Jesus that lifts up from our gloom and puts a new song in our heart. It's the blessed hand of Jesus that lifts us from the life of shame and puts us on a pathway of glory. It's the blessed hand of Jesus that lifts us from the life of sin, puts us on the road to glory in the hand of Jesus. It's the blessed hand of Jesus that lifts us from the life of sin, Puts us in our life of honor and purity. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign which shall be spoken against. To a friend, I see that all the time and it makes my heart ache. 
when I see people. It makes my heart happy when I see them accept Jesus. It makes my heart ache when I see them turn from Jesus because I know what they're turning from. They're turning from the light to the eternal darkness. They're turning from Jesus, the light of the world, and they're going to be in a torment forever and ever. That's what Jesus said. I see them confronted with Jesus Christ. And that's what we preach every week, every week, every week. It's just Jesus, that's all. I see them reject Jesus and fall. I see them accept Jesus and rise. Reject and fall, accept and rise. Oh, would God, would all of you just come to Jesus and just call on the name of the Lord and you can be saved. Then Simeon closes his prophecy as he continues to speak to Mary. And he says, uh, yea, a, a word, a sword shall pierce through thy, your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And he's talking about her heart. He's talking about that sword going to pierce her heart. And, and we think Joseph is dead by now because otherwise he would have mentioned Joseph also. But just Mary. He's talking to Mary. And I wonder so many times what Mary thought about if, if she didn't think about these words. Surely she thought of these words and pondered them to the heart. She must have thought of them when she saw her son rejected by Israel, when she saw her son opposed by the priests, when they saw her son, when she saw her son so, so poor and misunderstood, when they saw him and thought of the first prophet of Simeon. She thought about that when she saw Jesus on the cross, when she saw his blessed hand spiked to the cross, and saw the blood and the anguish of her soul, uh, of his, her, his soul. She must have thought of that when she saw that awful crucifixion with the thorn-crowned brow, with that pierced in his brow. See, she must have thought of that when she saw the blood and the dirt and the sweat and the cursing and the taunting and the laughing and the mockery and all of it when she heard him cry from the cross, not once but seven times. Oh, God, she must have thought of that prophecy 33 years ago when Saul when Simeon said, saw a sword going to pierce your soul, Mary. And finally, Simeon's prophetic song closes with this. The thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus Christ is the revealer of thoughts. He is the revealer of hearts. Jesus Christ shows us what a man's real character is. Jesus Christ reveals the thoughts of the hearts and there's no neutrality, no inter, inter, no inner ground, neutral ground. Remember what Paul said on the, about the cross of Christ? He said it would be offense to many. They are offended at the cross of the crucified Christ. The preaching of the cross offends them. When Christ is preached, people show their true colors, their character in full. To some, there's open defiance. There's open enmity. To others, there's rejoicing and comfort and encouragement. Yes, the thoughts of hearts are revealed by Jesus Christ. No hiding there. And where are you today? Where are you today? What does Jesus Christ mean to you? How do you react when I tell you that he's, he's claiming you and he wants you to come to him and confess your sins and receive him as a savior? How do you react? And I'm talking a lot of the men because the men seem like they're the, the toughest, the hardest to come to Christ. And the older they get, the tougher they get. The longer you're in it, the, you're a mutt in a rut. And you don't get out very easy, but you can by the Spirit of God. And I, oh, I just pray. And I'm just saying, are you for him or are you against him right now? Do you love him or do you put him off? Do you stumble or do you define life in him? Just like Simeon said, you're going to rise or you're going to fall. I pray to God that you arise. How do you do that? You just pray, dear Jesus, I'm a poor lost sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart and take away my sin. And I'll forsake that sin the best I can. And I'll make you the Lord of my life. And I'll serve you the best I can. And thank you, Jesus. Just use your own words and talk to him. Don't forget the thee and the thous and the propers and things. Just talk to him. He's looking at your heart anyway. I hope you'll do that. Now, if you pray that prayer, I hope you write to us because we'll send you literature to get you started on the Christian life and you can grow in the Lord and you can be a servant of God. He needs every one of you and you write to the Christian Worship Hour. Christian Worship Hour. The box is 2002. 
2002. We're in Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402 USA. And I'm praying that you'll take Jesus. What better time than Christmas Day to take have Christ born in your life? You could do that. Now you write to us. And also we need your help. We need your financial help. We, we, James says you have not because you ask not. We're telling you our only income is God's people. And if you want this service to continue, if you think it's worth of the Lord, then you need to support us and help us. And you need to send it to that address and all those on, on, uh, on the, uh, inner, on the uh, short wave. Christian Worship Hour, Box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And now we're going to pray. And every, our prayers every week is for the persecuted church. Christmas Day, we're going to pray for the North, North Korea because they say that the most fierce persecution is in North Korea. So, Heavenly Father, we pray, first of all, multitudes will open their heart to you. And then we pray for your people in North Korea. Oh, God, they're going through some terrible times, and many of them are just going to be, maybe give their life. Homes are broken up. Bless them and help them and strengthen them. We know you will. And, Lord, to those who are on beds of sickness this Christmas day, or they're lonely, maybe nobody's going to see them, but you see them, and you love them, and we love them. And so give them comfort in their the heart. And dear Jesus, we just pray that oh, you'll be glorified in all we do and say. And we pray that there be multitudes born into the kingdoms and multitudes that are helped. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're glad to be with you this Christmas day. And I hope that you can, I hope we'll hear from you. That's the thing we want most of all. Have to hear from you. And we've got it on the screen there, box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota. We have a little Bible study we'll send you. You'll love that. And uh, so uh, that'll be our Christmas present to you. Free charge. How can you beat that? So we're hoping you have a wonderful Christmas. We hope you have a wonderful New Year. Pray that you're walking with the Lord. Pray you, and some of you I know all over the world, there are people turning to you. All over the world, only God can see them. Only God can tell. But when we get to glory, we're going to see them, meet them face to face. We're all going to be together around the throne of God. And I just can't wait. That is such a glorious time. So you write and you pray and you stand by and we'll do the same thing. And so then next week, we're going to have a sermon on starting the new year. So we'll be there and we'll be there and we'll worship the Lord together. God bless you. Love you all in Jesus' name. My dad loved to preach because he got to tell people of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If you would like to learn more about having a relationship with Jesus and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, click the encouragement link on our website at cwh.org. You may also stream more programs, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, and view Pastor Salem's devotions and answers. We would be most grateful if you would pray for this ministry and help us financially to continue proclaiming the gospel. God bless you.